So first, I just want to get a sense of um, who's in the audience. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Fast Pitch before. Okay, so that's maybe, I think, what, five people? Okay, great. Raise your hand if you are a for-profit. Wow, all the for-profits are in this row. <laughs> We've got about seven for-profits. So I assume the rest of you are, oh, raise your hand if you're a student track. Okay, two student, great and ambitious students here too. And then, so for the nonprofits that are left in the room, raise your hand if you are a, a, an established nonprofit, like so three years or above. Okay, so that looks about half the nonprofit. And then, and raise your hand if you're a, a nonprofit startup. Okay, okay, so that's a good mix. What's gonna happen later on is we're gonna break up into groups by your track and then you'll be able to get to ask um, uh, questions to the, the track leaders. So, um, if you could, is there a flip curtain? <laughs> so this is the agenda for today. We're gonna give you an overview, and we're gonna give you an overview, and then you'll get to hear from a panel of past winners, and you can ask them uh, questions. Um, and, Oh, and you'll also learn about the program, how it works, the time requirements and everything. And then we are gonna hear a great um, 15 minutes about storytelling from Deborah Drake, who's our, our uh, storytelling coach in chief. And then we'll break out into groups by the tracks and, and then you'll get to ask questions that you don't wanna ask in front of everyone else. Okay, how does that sound? Okay, so this is the fast pitch process and Maureen's actually gonna walk us through this, this illustration here. Okay. Well, how do you do? I'm Maureen O'Hara, and this is my fast, my fifth fast pitch. So I'm very excited to be here, and I am more excited to see you all here. I love my innovators, so I just have to give my little innovator talk. And we have innovators here tonight that can attest to that. Um, so where you are is we haven't started, we're, we're just in the application phase of the process. How many of you have started your applications? Okay. Um, start getting on those applications. You can uh, be reviewing them over time. Your application has to be completed by June 20th. And if someone double checks my dates for me, I really appreciate it. June 20th. We will send you in emails. Um, is Anthea outside? Anthea? Yes. Anthea? <laughs> Anthea Fernandez is the Innovators Communication Lead. She will be communicating with all of you once you start getting your application started. She will be sending you reminders, get the application done. You've got two days, you've got one day, you've got three hours, you've got one hour, um, one hour left. It's amazing, you do shut the applications on time. If you have an issue with your applications, tell us and we can talk about it. Um, but the deadline is midnight on June 20th. What happens after um, the applications are in, we have people that will screen your application. So we'll be going over the rubric tonight, and what they do is they evaluate your application according to the different rubric. We have one rubric for the nonprofits, and we have a different rubric for the for-profits, and there's a great deal of overlap, and we'll go through those details. The rubric that we use to screen your applications is the same rubric you will be used when you get feedback at the pitch clinics, at the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and the final showdown. We do not change the rubric at all. So that's a yay. The only difference is, and she said we're not changing it, but there's a difference, is that once you start presenting, we talk about your presentation skills, where on the application, we can only talk about your presentation in terms of how you've written. That's a pretty obvious difference, okay? So don't get mad at me about that. Um, so we, what we'll do in, um, in mid-July, and I believe the date is July 15th, Anthea? Something like that, okay, she, she's in charge. Um, we will get an email from us, and hopefully you will all get emails from us that you've A, been accepted into, the into our program. Uh, we take 56 applicants into our program, innovators, we will call you quarter finalists, and at that point we'll assign you coaches, a coach or two coaches. Um, and it depends on who we have available for coaching and how many coaches we have. Um, We'll make available to you in August a pitch clinic. And that's where we have you practice your pitches and we bring in some of our super coaches, so people that have coached for years, people that judge for years, and we will give you feedback on your pitch. This is an entirely practice session. You can have your coach come and watch you do that. 
And it's the only time where if, a, if, a, if one of our, our judges or coaches gives you feedback and gives you a question about it, you can explain yourself. And you can say, well, I was thinking about talking about that, but I thought it was maybe duplicating what I said earlier. You can have that. I'm giving you an example of a conversation. I'm going to have a question about this. You know what dates uh, yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, the 20s. So where you go over it, we'll give you all the dates. They're, they're, everything is carved in stone. Okay, just because I don't remember it, I'm old. <laughs> okay. um, and so you'll be able to have an interactive session with uh, with our super coaches. Um, we have Christine Gilbert in the room. Okay, Christine um, ha helps us run these clinics, and she actually runs the showdown for us. And she's been part of the program since the, since its inception, so she knows more about it than anybody else. Okay, um, then the first week in August, uh, September, and I do have those things, I just don't have them memorized, we will have the quarterfinals. We have a separate quarterfinals for the students than we have for the non-student groups. That means the for-profits, the um, established um, non-profits, and the startup non-profits all have, um, have the quarterfinals together, and then we run the students on a Saturday or Sunday, I believe it's a Sunday, and it'll probably be at University of Washington. Okay, we, um, um, Staying open to see if I get a really sexy, sexy location for free that for that place because that would be kind of fun because that's on the weekend. At the quarterfinals, we cut our pool in half and we have our 28 semifinalists. If you're a semifinalist, that is very cool because that means you get to be at the showdown. It doesn't mean that you're presenting, but that means you have get to have um, an exhibition table at our final showdown on the 24th of um, October. So you should all like start tattooing 24th of October into your eyes so when you close your eyes you can actually see that date. Okay. Um, we then have about three weeks in between the quarterfinals and the semifinals. Um, and there'll be a clinic in between there. That date is still, that's the only date I don't have yet. Um, and we will have the semifinal presentation. And then with the sem competitions, we will have all five, um, and this chart is up on the um, website, but feel free to take a picture of it because Julie worked very hard on it to get it for us. Um, at the semifinal competition is when we determine the 14 finalists that will present on stage at McCall Hall. Now, something interesting about the semifinalists is that we will have some awards that we call themed awards or named awards. Um, and these awards are smaller awards, but they also are given to semifinals. So we will pretty much work out in advance from the semifinals who will be seeing the themed awards. So even if you're not a finalist, you can still receive a grant, okay? I should repeat that grants only apply to the nonprofit and students. They do not apply to the for-profits. Okay, um, at, the semi, at the final showdown, we have the top 14 go on stage. It is very exciting. We have our panel of celebrity judges that made the termination. Everybody gets lots of money. People come and talk to you. We'll have a thousand people in the hall, people that will pay anywhere between, um, for an adult ticket, $100 to $250 ticket to come and to see you guys present. These are the who's who's in Seattle. These are people that are connected into the community. These are people that are there because they want to know what's happening in social impact in Seattle. They want to know what you guys are doing. Um, what happens after the final showdown only applies to the for-profits. The top for-profit innovators, those who present on stage, will be invited to present at an impact forum. So we will bring in um, SVP partners and their close friends who are all qualified investors. And then you'll have to be, be able to do between a 15 and 20 minute more in-depth presentation. And these people will be people that would, are coming because they are interested in hearing your presentation because they are interested in investing in social impact. So those are for the four profits. Okay, I know I talk fast. Any questions? Julie will probably have one. Yes. For nonprofits, do you accept applications from organizations that are fiscally sponsored but not standalone profits? Yes. Good question. Yes. Uh, how many applications do you take to this a year? Um, anywhere between 100 and 130. In historically, but if, um, we're working to get those numbers up. Any other questions? Good questions. Julie. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so these are, um, these are the benefits to, uh, to innovators. Um, you'll get one to two professional coaches. These are really, we, we pull from 
Um, we, ha we just have an amazing pool of, of coaches who have run their own companies, their own nonprofits, and, um, and they're giving a lot of their time, at least 20 hours um, of their time over the summer. Um, and then there's the, the connections. You know, I heard from one year we had the Planned Parenthood, which is a huge organization, come pitch. And their innovative program was an at-home STD test. Planned Parenthood doesn't need our money, right? I mean, they have so much money. And um, CEO later on told me, you know, what we, re what we got, the, the dedication of the volunteers was, was super valuable. Um, and she also got to bond with her development team, but she said the best part was this exposure to a whole new audience of potential um, donors and supporters that she normally wouldn't get. So that's also a big benefit of being part of Fast Pitch. Um, and then, yes, and then you can see opportunities to get grants and prizes. And we also work really hard to get media coverage for our, um, for our innovators as well. So this is for the for-profit track. This is what qualifies you. Um, basically, three years and under, you have to have a, uh, you have to have a, be a mission-oriented organization, and just have a strong connection to this region, um, and at least in the at least in the seed stage. And you have to participate in all of the clinics and all of the programs. Yes. For the three years or younger, um, where, when do you start measuring it? Is it like when you incorporate or when you actually? I think when you. I was when did you file your five hundred one c three? Oh no, so no, for for profit, for profit. For profit, sorry, incorporate. Yeah, incorporate. So if you if you incorporated and you're more than three years ago, you're not just not eligible even if you didn't start doing anything, say for until the last year. Um, I would say take that. Instead of an email conversation with me personally, you can talk to Probably you'll be fine, okay. but we, you're not the only one that has presented that. You set up the final, you set up a corporation, and then you'll get going for a while. Right. Yeah, um, set up a email. Thank you. So, this is um, for the nonprofits. Um, for the nonprofits, we the managing staff actually has to be here in the Puget Sound. So, that's a big difference between the for profits, which they don't necessarily. Um, they have to have a strong connection, but for the nonprofits, you have to be here in the Puget Sound. Um, and then this is, so then the difference between the startup nonprofit track and the established nonprofit track, the big difference is how old you are and how big your budget is. So even if you're only two years old and your budget's a million, you're an established nonprofit. Um, and so, yeah, you do need to, you, it's okay if you're if you don't have 501c3 status now, but you need to get it by September 1st. Uh, Maureen, do you want to talk through any of these specific? Oh yes. So going back to that slide, you said that, um, you need to start the application for C3 status by September 1. No, you have to have your 501c3 status or have a fiscal sponsor. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I yeah. Wanted yeah. To clarify. Right. You have to be registered. The as reason one. is that we can't allow you to be a semi-finalist and win money if you're not a valid charity. Okay, gotcha. So, so and one or the other by yeah. September 1. Right. And Anthea will be the one that On everything that you see up here, we do send you reminders. Um, we want to guide you through the pilot. <coughs> Our goal is for you to be successful. So, um, so talking about the dates, I think oh, I spoke to... Talking here. Whoops, I'm supposed to talk in there. I'm sorry. Um, so speaking of the dates, we have all the dates up here. Um, one of the things I wanted to start talking about on this slide was talking about your responsibility. So applying to Fast Pitch, the great news is we provide you with coaching, we provide you with networking, we provide you with the opportunity to win money, we provide you with clinics. Um, we will do what we, what we can for you. We'll start getting you into the SVP network. But there's work to be done on your part. Um, you should expect that before the pitch clinic, uh, does anybody have a pre presentation deck already prepared that they use? So you're, you're, you're for profit, you're ahead of the game. I'm just not surprised there. You've got, oh, student group. You guys are hot. <laughs> Did you participate in the UW or the SU competition? No, but I presented to the perspective of Love you. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll, Figure it's going to take you between 20 and 40 hours to put together your first car presentation deck. Um, I have three innovators in the room. Um, Dirk, what, how long did it take you to do your first deck? Do you remember? Can you remember? Danica, Ryan, you guys have? I had a deck before. Hours? Okay. 
she's she, yeah, she's a for profit. I mean, she's going to be so ahead of the game. It's not funny. Mm -hmm. Okay. Expect between 20 and 40 hours to get that first presentation deck done. Your coaches that you get, they will not be on your board. They are not volunteers for your organization. They will go over your slides with you. They will give you their, their minimum contribution to your endeavor from the time that you're assigned to them until you get to the quarterfinals is between 10 and 20 hours. If you get two coaches, you get even more time. Um, so you wanna make sure you make that time available to them. They will Skype with you, they will go over your slides with you, they will sit in a Starbucks or a coffee shop or any place you want with you and have you go do your presentation again, do your presentation again. No, you know what, that slide doesn't work, let's redo it, let's go through it again. They will give you that amount of time, but you have to be available to give the time to them. So I want you to be clear about that. Once you get um, to the quarterfinals, if you have very short periods of time in there, it's a three week period to get to the semifinals and semifinals to the final showdown, it's another three week period. There's gonna be work to be done on your part. You'll probably be adding in another clinic with Dan Kranzler who will meet with everybody individually and help you spruce up your presentations. It's a gift, it's a great thing to have. You have to make the time available. So this is not the time to have your wedding, <laughs> okay, um, to plan a two-week vacation to Hawaii. I do that after fast pitch is over because that's when I like claps when it's all over. I'll, I'll, I'll go away for a few days. Um, so you want to make sure you have a lot of time available. In that time between the quarterfinals and the final showdown, we tell the coaches to expect to give you another 10 to 20 hours each. So a minimum of 10 hours, a minimum of 20 hours. That means over the present, over your whole program here, you'll receive between 20 and 40 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching time. And again, this is strict coaching time. You will have a few deadlines you're gonna to have to meet. Anthony will make you very aware of the deadlines. You have to get slide decks in before they're due because we have to be able to build the decks and we wanna make it equitable to everyone. We make it as fair as we possibly can so everybody gets us the deck at the same time. Anthea cannot be bribed, I'm gonna tell you that right now because we probably have some innovators try. All right, but we make it as fair as we can for you guys. Any questions on the dates? Yes, ma'am. After the final showdown for the for profit um, 15 to 20 minute presentation, what is when that usually occur? James, so what's the date on that? November 15th? The uh, the 14th. 14th. Or the yeah. yeah, 14th. Okay, so you have another three week break in there to prepare for that. Good question. Yes, James. One um, housekeeping thing, just because I see everyone's hands getting tired. Um, we will follow up and send this presentation and we have a recording, so key dates will follow up and it'll be a great account. I want to introduce Jamisa Gorley. Jamisa is the SVP fast pitch staff lead. So I am the, a volunteer. I'm, I, I lead the coordination of the Innovator Program, which is what you guys are all involved with, and Jamisa and I are semi-attached at the hip. Okay, and then you'll meet eventually Patricia Friel, who runs the showdown. Um, which is a whole project unto itself. So Jamisa, myself, Anthea, and Friday, who's, sorry, where he is, who is the coach leader, are some of your primary contacts that are in the room right now. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, what makes a good application? Some of these seem really basic, but I gotta tell you, I mean, there are some applications that we get that are just not complete. Answer all the questions. Proofread, have someone else look at it, have a third set of eyes even look at it, um, and also just be realistic. Um, and, and, and also, I mean, as you're going through this, it's actually important to look through the application earlier so that if you have any questions, you can ask those questions. What you don't want is on June 20th, you have all these questions because you didn't ask them earlier and, and you're trying to do it right against the deadline. We have several people in the room, we have people that we call super coaches. If you have questions on the application, or if you, we, we can't look at the, read a paragraph for you and tell you how it's going to score in the rubric. That wouldn't be really fair because I can't do that to everybody. But if you have questions, we have people that can help you. Um, and please ask us questions. We love the innovators. We want you all to succeed, especially you guys in the room because you came to our open house. Okay, so you guys are like more special than everybody else, but don't tell the other people. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so is there like a list of contacts? Like how do we do contact? contact you will have, you, that, will, yeah. you will be getting contact information for all of us, okay? And we'll do our best we can to answer questions for you without going too deep. Um, I want to touch on one thing about the uh, copy edit and complete all sections. 
Um, we're in the position sometimes to give out $25,000, and you really do want to put your best foot forward in those applications. Um, and even in your process of dealing with us, um, that information does make it through the people that run the deliberations and select who moves forward in the, in the um, program, in our program. So if we want to give you $30,000 and your stuff is sloppy or you're missing deadlines and we're, you know, Anthea is giving you a five minute extension, which she probably ever does, <laughs> and, but that's consistent, that feedback will get back to our deliberators because if you can't hit the deadlines, if you can't do things cleanly, gee, are you the right one for us to give $30,000 to? And that's just your business. And if you were in our shoes, you would go, yeah, that makes sense. If I don't really have my act together enough, it's not like the dates are surprises, like I tell my kids when they were doing their homework. It's not like you didn't know. All right. So give it a little thought because that does, it not just makes your application better, it will affect you throughout the program. Thank you. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now what I want to do is just go through some of the um, some of the, the judging rubrics that we have. We basically judge on societal um, impact, innovation, sustainability, um, leadership team, and presentation. And the for-profit has also their own set of rubric. The, um, the thing that they have in common is the social innovation leadership team in, I think, the... Social impact, innovation, and leadership. Yeah, and leadership. And so when, for the for the four profits, we'll actually just, Pradi's going to go talk about that in detail in the breakout <coughs> session since there are only seven of you here. Um, so I just want to give a couple of quick examples of what we mean by societal impact. So something that's going to score low on societal impact is I, um, you set up a tutoring program for kids in, in White Center in Spanish. Something that's going to score a bit higher is you teach kids to tutor in Spanish to other kids and you create a system for, um, for kids teaching other kids. Something that's got high impact is those videos go, you start videotaping kids and they're, and, um, and they're talking about tips on reading tips in Spanish and that's actually being able, they can use it in, um, across the country. Okay? Um, something about innovation is, um, for example, there's an after-school program that teaches kids how to bike. The next one is you teach something a, a level up is you create a, um, a system for kids to earn used bikes so that kids who can't afford bikes can, can get bikes. Something that would be truly innovative, innovative is if you set up a system for kids to become um, to repair bikes and set up repair sh mobile repair shops and that actually is able to create franchises in different neighborhoods. All right, so something that's really just that um, hasn't been thought of before. In terms of sustainability. I want to jump on that for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, on um, innovation. There we go, on innovation and, and social impact. Um, a question that we frequently get is, do we go broad or do we go deep? So do we want our program to appeal to as many people as we can, or should we touch a select group um, very deeply? And the answer is yes. So I can tell you that going broad is slightly better, but going deep is fine, um, as long as you're going deep in a very meaningful way. But I, what I recommend is you be clear on what your program is doing. Are you going broad or are you going deep? Having that distinction clear. And to try not to be all things to all people because that then says you're not focused on your mission. Mm -hmm. Great. And then in terms of sustainability. So an example is um, in the beginning of an organization, if your plan is only to ever get government grants and donations, it's fine to get government grants in the beginning, but if that's, oh, we're just gonna keep applying for grants, and that's going to actually score pretty low on the sustainability because there could be reasons why those grants are cut, right? And then it, it's really hard for you to, um, to sustain yourself. Um, something that might be a bump up is you figure out a way to sell a product um, and, and that brings in some income. But you, you're, you're still not quite sure of um, how popular this product will be, how sustainable this product will be. Let's say you have a catering business and you're relying on the, the profits um, from that catering business to then um, pay um, pay the overhead. And then something that is truly, that could be a lot more sustainable is, um, let's say you also build in an apprenticeship program and you're teaching people 
you're, um, you're teaching people how to serve food and how to cook. And then you're also letting those people um, apprentice at local restaurants and the restaurants actually pay you the fee um, or pay you a fee to have these um, these apprentices for a while, and so you're not only able to make profits from the the food that you sell, but also from um, the people that you trained, and then they are actually able to go out um, afterwards and get full time jobs. And then, oh, and then leadership team. So leadership team, um, something that would. Something that kind of scored low on the leadership team is you've got five people who all think that they're your family members and your friends and they think that this is a really great idea and, and that's how you start the business, okay? Bump up from that is you actually look at what you need on your team. Let's say you've got a, um, um, a food business and you realize, okay, we need someone who is really good at food marketing and someone who, um, and so, and someone who's actually worked in a restaurant before and, um, and someone who's also really good at finances. And so that's, that's, a, that's a good balanced team. And so that maybe your food marketing person is someone who loves food and they have a food blog. And then where you're gonna score really high are people who actually um, have experience, who actually get paid, who have gotten paid in the past to do those things. Um, someone who has maybe worked at, um, ran a restaurant for 10 years as a manager and someone who did um, food marketing and um, someone who's an accountant. So um, that's where, that's the scale of things. And then presentation, Deborah, do you want to just talk a little bit about what's... We should introduce Deborah. Yeah, and Deborah Drake, our chief storyteller. Yeah, you want to talk in here, into the mic? First off, come in the front of the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my five years with Fast Pitch, I streamed hundreds of applications and been at quarterfinals and end levels and I have seen so much improvement so if you're not a good presenter don't worry about it because if you really apply yourself to this program you will become a better presenter and a good presenter isn't always perfect but it's as if you can just feel them generating and speaking from their heart they have their facts they have their stories it's just so crystal clear and a real quick example it was uh, 2013, Tana Rose, Recovery Cafe. She was so nervous and she had all of her very words on a, a, a circular deck of index cards. By the time she got to finals, she didn't need that index card set, but she started and she was just, even though all that, she was just, she, she went from quarterfinals to finals because she was a great presenter, even with the notes, and then she kind of lost her need for the blanket so heart and head in synchronicity and natural voice and we'll see it thank you thank you deborah okay um so Prati's going to go over this later on this is the scoring rubric for for profits and now i'd actually like to introduce our panel of past winners ryan dirk Tanika. So they all happen to be um, winners from 2015. 2015. Um, and so we're just going to have a Q, short Q&A with them, and then you'll be able to actually chat with them more because they will be leading some of the breakout sessions. Brian was a student innovator. Tanika yes. is a for-profit. And um, Dirk is a startup nonprofit. So if you could just go down the line and introduce yourself to Oregon, um, what where it was, the state it was in 2015 when you applied and why you decided to apply. Yeah, so starting with me, I guess, because we're... So hi, I'm Ryan Akers, um, and I was in the university track, um, the Social Venture Partners in uh, 2015. When I uh, came to the program, we had just founded the company. We had actually had some success at the University of Washington, and some folks had let me know about the SVP, and so we were uh, just learning the ropes and just learning how to present to people and uh, and basically it changed our whole uh, path for the better for sure. So I'm Tanika Lockford and my company's Deep Roots Foods. So in 2015 
we had a very good business plan that was about 110 pages. Um, <laughs> it's a very robust plan. <laughs> um, and we had a couple of clients. We're a co-packer. So Deep Roots Foods manufactures other people's brands for them. And we specialize in small batch co-packing. So small local brands can compete in the global marketplace. Um, and we had a great business plan and we needed to finish our funding. So we had raised, we were trying to finalize 280,000 and we had raised about 95 of that before we came to SVP. So it's been, help us finish raising our rates. <laughs> Because we had a, you know, a loose idea of what we were going to do. And actually sitting down and, and talking to somebody and talking through the process and really what your business plan is and how you articulate that to an audience is really important. So you know, we had this kind of not 110 business page business plan, but it's pretty, pretty non-focused. So it's really helpful to have professionals look at what you're doing, focus it, and then when you want to articulate that to other investors or philanthropists, that's really helpful. Dirk also won most improved. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah. That was a lot of work. Yeah. Coaches, right? Yeah. How the coaches impact So the coaches impacted us in a in a lot of ways. So I'll give a few tips. Our pitch kind of changed every round um, because of the the coaches. So we originally went in just like we would go into any other investment, like. This is a story. This is why we're important. We need this amount of money. You need us. Um, and it kind of altered and changed. And our, and our coaches were, were gentle and also stern when they needed to. And, and it was an amazing experience. I think at the end, we left with a lot more kind of coaches and support than we thought we would. Um, and it, it totally changed the avenue of our pitches and conversation with you. Yeah, I have a
So as a for-profit, I already had 110 page business plan. So I felt like the application was easy. I had to scale back a little bit because I had a very robust business plan. So my, my, my kind of point to you all for for-profit is make sure you read clearly the questions because you get really amped about your company and what you can do. So make sure you pay attention to the sustainability section of it. You might be doing something that you're just like, it's sustainable and I can have an impact on my local environment and my local community, but really take a step back and make sure that you're answering the exact questions. Um, and have someone else once over it and make sure that you're you're kind of if you're stuck in spending too much time on it it's kind of like school just walk away for a second it shouldn't take exceedingly long for you to go through the application process because it's your company and it's what you do and i wasn't asked to but i attached that very robust 110 page <laughs> business plan to our application so if i did kind of miss something they knew we were serious and they knew i'd taken the time to go through the process with a very robust business plan yeah i'll say a plus one on that we uh we had a lot of information and a lot of times I'd review what I wrote and I'd realize I didn't even answer the question at all. So I'd have to kind of go back over and then I had somebody else look at it. And then even they would say, I didn't really even ask, answer the question. So you really have to articulate and really understand the evaluation criteria. So you really address it. And that's really just as far as the application process, just really make sure you answer the questions. I want to add to what Jake and just said. And that, that's why we walk through the rubric. As you're answering the question, and I love that, make sure you're answering the right question because I read applications and they wrote a lovely paragraph and they didn't answer the question. So I can't, even though the application, the, the program is fabulous, I can't score the application as high as I could because they didn't answer the question. It breaks my heart. What we're looking for is those criteria that Julie presented in the rubric. That's what the questions are about, is we're looking to evaluate you on the rubric. So if you read it into the question and there's something else that you can bring out in your application that's touched on in the rubric and there's a detailed explanation on the rubric on the page, feel free to, to fill that in. The application is organized by the rubric. So we have the questions that talk about social impact, the questions uh, that talk about innovation. And if you have something that's innovation, innovative about your program, make sure you have it in that question so we can score your application the highest in that area. Thank you. Okay, so be, um, we're going to go into storytelling and then we'll do the breakout sessions. But before we do, if anyone has some questions where they think it would really benefit everyone here, then please raise your hand. We have time for a couple of questions. Otherwise, if it's kind of really specific to your application or to your track, then wait till the breakout session. Yes. Would you say that these kinds of awards and opportunities are really best fitted for an organization that has like 40 hour a week full-time staff, or is it okay if you're a smaller organization that has like one part-time staff member? Dirk, why don't you answer that? <laughs> okay. <laughs>